everybody and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program. Today we are going to be discussing spring and springing into your Florida Friendly Landscape. Um, with that being said, it's hard to you know determine exactly when spring in Florida is. Sure feels like it right now. In fact, feels almost kind of summery in the afternoons. Um, we're in that limbo period. Yeah, we see these azaleas everywhere. And to me, that's a sure sign of spring. But we're not out of the woods yet as far as freezes or anything goes. So let's talk a little bit about that. I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities. I work for the water department here in Hernando County under water conservation. If you have any questions, or if you'd like a PDF copy of this presentation when I'm finished, please email me at lillyb, L-I-L-L-Y-B, at hernandocounty.us. And um, that really is the absolute best way to reach me. Some people try you know, to message me on Facebook. I don't have that. It's not set up that it pops up. I don't have that Facebook uh, page on all the time. So, you know, you may not hear from me immediately. I may not be aware that you tried to message me. So if you really want to get a hold of me, do it through this email. I can't really escape the email <laughs> unless it's on, you know, an evening, weekend, holiday then, but I'll certainly get back to you as soon as I can. Good morning, buddy. Welcome. Welcome from Tallahassee. Buddy's joining the ladies today. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get some more gentlemen as well. These are the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. Every class that I teach, every program that I present is going to relate back in one way or another to one or more of these nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. Um, and today, uh, springing, we're going to, I bet we'll cover on nearly all of them in this one, because in this program, we're gonna go kind of quickly. That's why you may want a PDF at the end, um, because this is like many samplers of many things, of uh, the many aspects of spring uh, here in Central Florida. So we're not gonna cover deeply any one thing, but we're gonna cover many things. There's about 45 slides which I can do because uh, Dr. Lester isn't doing this with me. If I uh, do more than 10 slides in any program that he's involved in, he whines and fusses. So, you know, he's not here. We're just gonna go, <laughs> we're gonna go through this. As I alluded to at the beginning, what does spring mean in Florida? I mean, we have the, you know, the, the official date of spring across the world and um, which I, somewhere in March, I think, March 21st, something like that, possibly. But Florida, if you may not have noticed, is different than the rest of the world. So we kind of live in our own, you know, uh, geographical, horticultural world here in Florida. So when it's spring, I'm safe to say it's spring because I see azaleas blooming. Spring, though, though, does not mean we are out of danger of frost. I just want you to make you aware of that. So um, we have been speaking lately in different programs and even in the virtual plant clinic about when is it safe to clean up um, the frozen plant material that I'm sure almost all of you probably have experienced. And see, that depends on many factors. Um, buddy up in, the, up in Tallahassee may have to wait a little longer than someone who might be listening from the homestead area. Uh, PJ in uh, Ocala, you maybe have to wait you know, a week or so longer than maybe some of us in Hernando County. Um, we used to be able to tell you without a doubt that there will be no more frost or freezes after March 15th until, you know, possibly end of October or so. And then, you know, things just started changing. We just can't say absolutes anymore. 
in the past 10 years or so, we've had frosts and freezes on April 3rd. So that's why I put this, uh, this time frame somewhere in between March 15th and April 5th. You can really start in earnest cleaning up that dead plant material. Why we don't want you to do it right away, why we want you to live with the ugly is again, danger of another frost or freeze. It's gonna be in the mid eighties today. You are not gonna feel like we're gonna have another frost or freeze. But you know what they say about Florida. If you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. <laughs> we generally can do pretty well with a 10 day outlook, you know, on the weather uh, programs and things. But we don't know that we're not going to have another frost or freeze. This uh, frozen banana plant here is actually being protected from another freeze by the dead plant material. If um, pruning encourages new growth, new growth is very susceptible to frost or freeze damage. And new growth is always closer to the core of the plant or even the roots of the plant. So you could bring that damage to the, the heart of the plant and kill it. Whereas if you left the ugly dead material on it, there would have been some protection there. Now that also depends on the plant. This, this banana tree here you know, is a great example of how the dead material can protect the new growth that's trying to come. I have some sage, various sages in my front bed. Well, you know, they're long and stringy and the dead things here at the top are not doing anything really for the new growth that's gonna literally come from the ground. So, you know, it's okay to cut off those, you know, just so there's some nasty looking material you can get rid of and neaten up your yard. And what I've actually done is, you know, kind of cut them down and built like little tiny tents, <laughs> not totally covering up, but, you know, just over that new growth so it can protect it that way. So it's gonna be hard. It feels like spring and you are going to, everything inside of you when it's so bright and sunny is going to want out there, go out there and cut all the old dead stuff, you know, and plant all the new stuff. And it might not be quite the time till the beginning of April. And I know it's hot at the beginning of April, but that's just, you know, the weird weather patterns we have here in Florida. So, but there are plenty of things you can do right now. You can prune woody plants anytime in Florida, any time of year. So, you know, it's a good time to do that. I'm not going to get into a crepe myrtle, um, you know, lecture <laughs> right now. We, we say that plenty of times. Just know that because, just because everybody severely prunes or hat racks crepe myrtles, that is not recommended by the University of Florida a much more kinder, gentler, um, you know, pruning is recommended, not that severe pruning. But any of your woody plants, you can prune anytime in Florida. And we do have classes on proper pruning. That's a class unto itself. We do want to let you know your spring bloomers. I mean, the azaleas here, uh, you know, have already, they're, they're mid bloom, you know, they're, they're midway through their bloom season. Um, so when should you cut those back? As soon as they're done blooming is the ideal time. So when you know you're not getting any more blooms and you want to prune your azaleas, that's the time to do it. If you're a procrastinator, don't procrastinate for any of your spring blooming plants. All of them, you should do it as soon as their bloom time is done. The camellias are probably already done. Good time to prune those. The other, any of your spring blooming, Blooming plants, um, do it as soon as they're done or no later than June 30th. So that's a good, you know, if you're a procrastinator, you don't want to do it any later than June 30th. Why? I mean, it's not going to destroy the plant. It's going to take away your spring blooms and you'll be, you know, disappointed that you don't have those. It's an easy date for me to remember. That's my birthday. So I have to get that done <laughs> by my birthday. Another thing you can do um, out there during this, you know, when you really want to get out there because it's so nice, is uh, time to refresh your mulch. 
or add more mulch, you know, to beds, widen your beds. Mulch, you know, is a fantastic element of your Florida friendly landscape. It improves the soil, which, you know, that's never a bad thing. It does ease maintenance, improves plant performance, adds to the to the beauty, it just neatens up your landscape. I always say it makes your landscape look like you made the bed in your bedroom. You know, you can clean up the bedroom. If you don't make your bed, it, it doesn't look like a neat bedroom. Kind of the same thing with your flower beds and mulch. I think it's like making the bed really neaten things up. It does, if used properly, help suppress weeds. But, you know, if ignored, certainly wonderful weeds can grow on top of the mulch. What kind of mulch are we, do we recommend? Uh, pine bark, pine straw, melaleuca, eucalyptus, yard trimmings, leaves. Um, utility mulch, um, I do recommend that you use with caution. You know, if the electric company or their contractors are coming through, you know, shredding, cleaning up along the roadways. And you'd say, boy, I'd really like those chips. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but there's two things you need to be careful of. They are brand new. They're still breaking down. They're still what we call green. So they are pushing out a lot of energy, which pushes out a lot of heat. So don't throw them in your beds right away. Put them in a pile to season. The other thing is, those people's jobs or your Department of Public Works jobs are for public safety, to clear the trees away from the power lines, to clear the trees away from a sidewalk or an obstructed view by a stop sign, you know, a road, something like that. That's all their focus, that's their focus. So they get rid of the obstruction. Do they pay attention whether it is an invasive exotic tree? Of course not, that's not their concern. So think about these things and be you know, uh, just judicious when using utility mulch. What we don't recommend is rock. I love rock. I am a big rock fan, but um, you, I use rock decoratively. Uh, maybe as borders, maybe, you know, if I have a nice big rock as a, you know, centerpiece, something like that. But using rock as mulch doesn't add anything back to the soil. And it increases the heat, which is not good for your plants. Um, shells, kind of the same thing. Use rock and shells for pathways because those are wonderful. They, they fulfill the Florida Friendly Landscaping uh, principle of you know, reducing stormwater runoff by allowing water to go through instead of running off a solid surface. So use them for paths, things like that, but not where you grow your plants. Rubber mulch, we don't recommend. Again, it's hot. Another thing is, you know, what's in that rubber? We don't know. You know, what's leaching into the soil there, heavy metals, you know, just not something we recommend. Now, why it looks like one of these things is not like the other is like we're going to play the Sesame Street game here. Why do I have cypress mulch mixed in with these others? Don't run out in your yard and scoop up your cypress mulch. It's not going to hurt your yard. But you know what they say: when you know better, do better. So yeah, it's the cheapest thing to get right at the front door of the uh, big box store. But what's happening with cypress mulch is the producers thereof um, are just growing, going into the wetlands, shredding down the young cypress trees. There's not any old ones really left except in preserves. Um, so if you think you're getting some old hardwood termite fighting qualities out of cypress mulch, no, you're not. Um, but they take these young trees and shred them down just to put in bags and sell to us as mulch. It's not a byproduct of, you know, industry. It's not a sustainable practice. Therefore, that is why Florida Friendly Landscaping does not recommend it. The, the pines, you know, they're grown, they're quick growing, grown on plantations usually. 
it's a renewable resource. Using cypress mulch is not a renewable resource. That is why it's not recommended by Florida Friendly Landscaping. You get an itchy to fertilize probably if you are you know, someone who fertilizes, I usually forget about <laughs> that. But just remember, just because it's a certain time of year does not mean you need to fertilize. Ask yourself, why? Why do I want to fertilize it? What's the purpose of this? Um, you know, if your landscape appears healthy and everything's growing fine, skip the fertilizer. But if it looks unhealthy or chlorotic, don't, well, there's lots, here's the pattern that we as humans do when we see a sick plant. Oh, it looks sick, I better water it more. Well, that didn't work. Oh, it looks sick, I better fertilize it more. That didn't work. What you need to do is find out what the problem is before you decide to treat the problem. And your county extension office can help you with that. Maybe it's an underlying disease or an insect or something else causing that problem. Maybe it's the wrong plant in the right place, wrong place, and we'll just do better somewhere else. Don't just go to fertilizing as your first option. In fact, here in Hernando County, and I'm going to show you in a minute, we are still under a fertilizing uh, fertilizer blackout as far as our lawns go. So it being spring and you're eager to do something in your yard, this is a great time to get a soil analysis. So test that soil before you just automatically throw fertilizer on it to see if you need anything and what you need. Now, how do you do that? There's a pretty simple way. Um, I know Buddy and PJ, they have extension offices in Leon and Marion County. The others of you, you know, wherever you are, if you're in Hernando, wherever you are, you should have a county extension office here in Florida. Go to them and say, I wanna do a soil test on my lawn, on my fruit trees, whatever it is and they will give you these little brown paper bags um, and, a and <clears throat> a form, maybe even a box. They don't all have boxes. Um, and you will follow the instructions. Um, I think it's up to $10 per bag now, but it's a, like a conglomerate. If you're gonna do your lawn, you take little pieces from all over and you put it you know, in a box, you mail it to, the University of Florida in Gainesville <clears throat> to the soil lab there. They will send your results to your county extension office. We spoke to some people like if you live on the border of Pasco and you would rather it go to Hernando County, you've got to really note that um, on the paperwork or they're gonna send it to the county where you live. And they'll send you a copy. So if you're reading it and you're like, I do means that's when you pick up the phone and you call Dr. Lester, you call whoever your horticulture agent is, or they may have you speak to a volunteer master gardener, and they will explain to you what your soil test means. So that is the best way to do it before you just go around and just fertilize. Here in Hernando County, if you're not in Hernando County, I would suggest you look up and see if your county has any fertilizer ordinances because they're pretty common here in Florida because there's more and more um, attempts to protect our waterways. Uh, a lot of counties um, like to the south of us, they have summertime fertilizer bans, you know, because they're worried about the heavy rains taking the fertilizer right into the waterways. Here in Hernando County, um, going by the advice of uh, turf specialists at the University of Florida, the wintertime months when the turf is not growing, you know, that is, you don't need to be putting down any fertilizer at that time. The, the roots actually slough off almost all of their roots down in the ground because the grass is sleeping. So what are you going to do if you're going to put down fertilizer? Couple of things, either nothing's gonna happen, you wasted your time and your money. Um, and if a rain does come, it's just gonna go straight through the soil into the aquifer. Or if you did elicit a response, a growth response from your lawn 
by putting down the fertilizer. Remember I said, we're not out of the danger of frosts or freezes. Why, why are you waking your lawn up <laughs> to make it more susceptible to a frost or a freeze? So here in Hernando County, we have a lawn fertilizer uh, blackout phase from January 1st to March 31st. This does not apply to vegetable gardens or you know, individual bedding plants, just, just your lawn. Um, if you are a company, if you have a company, they are allowed, they are officially allowed if they apply slow release only. And the only reason they are given that leeway is because they have a lot of people to cover. And you know, the University of Florida even suggests you can start fertilizing in Central Florida around March 15th. So we're trying to give the professionals that leeway to start around March 15th so they have time to get all of their customers. Dr. Lester will tell you if they're fertilizing before March 15, you know, find out what they're doing. They, your lawn does not need fertilizer before that. For those of us who don't have professional services, it's not going to be the end of the world to wait till the beginning of April. So that, that is the, uh, the rules here in Hernando about fertilizing. Another thing we can do is it's a good time to evaluate your irrigation system if you happen to have one. I'm most likely not going to fertilize and I don't have an irrigation system, but for those of us who do, it's a good time to look at it and pay attention to it before you know the heat really comes and you know we start using it regularly. Well, the first thing you wanna look at Let's go to that box in your garage. Is, there is the time clock set properly? Here in Hernando County, also, we do have once a week watering restrictions. It goes by your address. I didn't put that um, in this slide, but you can find it. You can email me and I'll send it to you, or you can find it on our website or in many other of my presentations. Um, but pay attention um, on... March 13th, we're going back to daylight savings time that Sunday. So, you know, we always, you, you're encouraged to change the batteries in your smoke alarms. We also want you to pay attention to, to go look at your irrigation clock, make sure the time is set properly. Because at least here in Hernando County, code enforcement's not going to care that you forgot to change the time frame. So, if you don't know, how to handle um, your irrigation clock. Google has everything. YouTube has everything. Just put in the name of your irrigation system, what it says on that box there. You can probably order a manual online um, to find out how to make it work. But also um, you can put it on while during the day for a few minutes at a time to test each zone as long as you are out there actively looking at it and uh, look for broken sprinkler heads, something like this old faithful, you may not know if it's happening at two o'clock in the morning. So that's something you know, you'll wanna know about and fix. Misaligned heads, those heads get moved around so easily and maybe you're watering the street or your house or the driveway or a palm tree, you know, just bouncing right off of it. Look for those things. Clogged heads, we have a lot of sand here. When you mow, you know, um, moves a lot of dirt around. So just make sure there's no clogged um, irrigation heads. Mismatched sprinkler heads, what does that mean? If your irrigation system was installed properly, um, you should have the same heads in each zone, meaning you shouldn't have different types of irrigation heads in the same zone. So look out for that. Underground leaks. I work for the water company. I have seen horror stories from underground leaks. So if you if there's an area of your yard that never seems to you know dry up, it gets all kind of gushy mushy. I promise you having an irrigation contractor out there is going to be way cheaper than ignoring that problem. You get your water bill, uh, 
it could be disastrous. So please stay on top of that. And you know, while you have someone come out, have, have that person um, evaluate your system for you. I'm only gonna talk a little bit about lawns. I have a lawn class coming up, I think in April, everything you always wanted to know about your Florida lawn. Um, so I'm not going to harp on it right now. <laughs> But you know, we're gonna be paying more attention to our lawns. First of all, let me tell you, if your lawn is straw colored, we call that golden. Those are the golden lawns of winter. And I want you to know it's okay. It's okay to have a winter lawn. As the days are getting longer, and if we get some spring rains, the grass is going to wake up and start getting greener. So, you can fertilize. I would recommend doing that soil test first to see if it's necessary here in Hernando after March 31st. Don't use weed and feed products. That is not something that the University of Florida recommends. Maybe those type of products work up north. I'm not an expert on horticulture up there. Down here, well, if you have not already treated for your spring weeds, <laughs> They're probably already up and thriving. And you know, you're not allowed to fertilize yet, nor is it, nor is it a good time to fertilize yet. So those are two different applications that should be done at two different times. We have seen lawns killed from weed and feed applications. And the number one thing with your lawn, you know, if it starts growing a little bit, hold off, hold off, hold off. Mow that lawn at three to four inches. Keep it mowed at three to four inches. That is absolutely the key to a healthy lawn here in Central Florida. And um, your lawn only needs about half an inch to three quarters of an inch of water per watering event. You're going to ask me, what? <laughs> How do I know that? Tell me a time frame. Tell me how long to put each zone on. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't because I don't know your system. I don't know your water pressure, you know, all these variables. But I can tell you how to deliver half an inch to three quarters of an inch in a real simple uh, test. Collect some tuna um, fish cans or even some gladware cat food cans. Measure that half inch. Mark that with a Sharpie inside, a line there. Put several of them in your zone randomly. Turn that zone on, watch it, you know. Well, what Bill says to do is turn it on for 15 minutes. That way you won't be in any trouble and see how far it got. If it went past that line, then shorten the amount of time. If it looks like, you know, it almost got there and maybe put it at, you know, 20 minutes, something like that. So figure out time how long it takes to reach that half an inch. Or if I only got halfway there, then you know, oh, I need to put that zone on for half an hour. It's not rocket science, but you know, that's, that's a good way. And you will probably end up saving um, a lot of water in um, a lot of water, yes, and a lot of money in the water that you're putting out now. So it's spring and and you wanna get out and get new plants. <laughs> you know, that's just really what we wanna do and everyone's having their spring plant sales, things like that. So before you go out and buy those new plants, we check your available space. <laughs> we are all horror culturalists. <laughs> we'll find space. Um, I bought the lot next to me, so now I have, oh, you know, wonderful new space, mostly filled with trees though. We're still clearing it out. Make sure you check the soil and light conditions in your yard. You can even go out and sketch it out. Just, you know, a real simple sketch. This is where my house is. Over here, it's got morning sun. You know, over here is pretty shady and you decide what type of plants you want in those areas. Also, this is very important. Decide how much maintenance you are going to do. And I mean, literally that you're going to do. I don't mean that you, in your spring fever phase, <laughs> think you wanna do. Be honest with yourself, how much are you going to do? So research plants to get exactly what you want. 
and plan before you buy. This is such a hypocritical list <laughs> that I'm speaking here, but this really is the best way to do it. And just remember failure to plan is planting to fail. So what are we gonna get here in Hernando County? We are in zone 9A. Buddy, you, where is Leon County? You may be up here, you know, uh, in 8A or 8B, wherever Tallahassee went <laughs> up here. Um, and PJ, you know, you're kind of in the middle. Wherever you are in Marion County, you may be in 8B or 9A. So all of this, unless you're listening from down here, and that's still not literally considered tropical, but you can get away with tropical plants. Certainly here in Hernando County, we are not tropical. We are what you call subtropical. So you can play with tropical plants. I just wouldn't spend a lot of money on them, um, you know, so that you don't waste the money. And in case you forget to bring them in when we have a cold front and you gotta consider what are the conditions in my yard? We just talked about that. You're gonna sketch that out. So you'll have a real good um, knowledge base there. See the boundaries that are 9A? Instead of just being straight across the state, why is that? Well, the horticultural zones are based on average high and average low temperatures. So that's how they came up with these squiggly lines. Um, they're supposed to be coming out like a humidity, even um, one based on humidity as well, but I haven't seen that come through yet. One great place to start is to find one of these books, the Florida Friendly Landscape Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. There are several ways uh, to get a hold of one of these books and they are all free. You can download it on your computer, but I know you don't wanna print that off. <laughs> It's a lot of pages. If you are in the Southwest Florida Water Management District um, in one of their 16 counties, then you can go to watermatters.org. Perhaps if you're not, if you're in St. John's or another water management district, check with them, see if they have this book. I'm not sure if they do. But here in the Southwest Florida Water Management District, they print these books off for me. I have uh, lots of boxes of them. I just went to their office on 41 and picked up eight boxes of uh, 40, I think, per box. So um, yes, literally, I picked them up. Ooh. And I have them here. But you can go to watermatters.org and look under their homeowner resources and order one, and they will mail it to your house for free or you can stop by the extension office. They have some. You can email me and say, can I come by and uh, pick one up? And I'll be glad to give you one. Or you can always go to the Master Gardener Nursery here in Hernando County um, in Brooksville on Oliver Street, Wednesdays and Saturdays, 8.30ish till noon. It'd start getting hot probably after April. That's going to be till 11. <laughs> and get one there. If you are in any of my rain barrel classes, I also give you one of those for coming to the class. Um, and instead of just relying on the, the big box stores, they're, they're okay, they're, you know, usually. You gotta be real careful there, but there are plenty of um, small nurseries out there or organizations that hold spring plant sales, such as um, native plant societies. I believe the Hernando chapter is having one at Shinsigit Hill in the uh, beginning of March. I don't remember the date. When I find that out again, I'll share it on my Facebook page. As I mentioned, the Hernando County Master Gardeners, their nursery is open all year long um, on Oliver Street in Brooksville. Uh, the Spring Hill Garden Club has um, a nursery on Parker Avenue off of Spring Hill Drive uh, at the Spring Hill Botanical Gardens. And yeah, this is the time of year where you really, you know, watch out, um, listen for the different organizations that are gonna have plant sales. And you might 
run across, you know, some great deals and especially, you know, the master gardeners and the native plant societies, that's where you're going to get a hold of maybe some of those native plants that aren't available in your big box stores. Whatever nursery you go to, that's where it starts. It starts in the nursery, it starts with healthy plants. So while you're there, you wanna turn over a new leaf. <laughs> Literally look under the leaves, see if there is evidence of scale or aphids, look for holes, distorted leaves, blisters, sticky leaves. You know, reject the plants where the foliage is wilted and, and limp. Look for yellow, brown, or black leaves. Avoid those leggy plants. They've been there too long. They're probably uh, pot bound. And I know we all wanna go to that clearance cart and buy the $2 plant and take it home and love it and bring it back to life. And we may have a story that where that was successful, but I just wanna warn you, any of these issues that I listed here, you don't wanna bring that home to your healthy plants. So, you know, sometimes we have to overcome that nurturing urge to protect our other plants too, and only bring home healthy plants. Once we've done that, it's important how we plant them. You know, the number one principle is right plant, right place. Jim Mall from Hernando County, he's now the uh, master gardener coordinator there. He adds an extra thing. <laughs> to for the success of your plant, right plant, right plant, right place, right care, because that's very important too. Um, and remember when you got them from any nursery, um, as their babies growing, they were given water all the time. So those plants are used to a lot of water. I'm not saying keep that up. I'm just saying wean them. <laughs> all plants, even drought tolerant plants, even native plants need water to be established. They need the same amount of water as any plant to be established. It's once that establishment phase is over, then they can you know, survive on natural rainfall. But also remember how you plant them, literally how you put them in the ground is extremely important. You're, wanting, you're gonna wanna plant them a little high. I feel a little nervous that it's a little too high. But the other thing that Jim Mall says is plant them high and they won't die. Plant them low and they won't grow. This picture here shows you, it's a very good graphic of how you should plant it. The root ball, how it was in the pot, the top of that root ball should be even with the ground. You want your hole to be twice as wide, but no deeper than the pot was, you know, than the plant was in the pot. And don't cover it up with mulch right away do it around it, but you want whatever moisture, you know, whatever water that you're giving it, to be able to get to those plant roots right away without the mulch being in the way of it collecting that. Also, this is very important and a lot of people want that instant gratification. Consider the mature size that's gonna be important later on down the road. So now that I gave you all those, tips of what to do in spring. I know you just want to see the plants. <laughs> so it's ooh and ah time right now to look at some suggestions of some pretty plants for spring. And I think most of these are going to stretch, you know, into summer for you. Maybe not these black eyed Susans. It says through July, eh. <laughs> I'd say beginning of June, really. Um, Maybe Buddy in Tallahassee gets to keep them through July. Um, these are a roadside flower, these, uh, these black eye Susans in North Florida from Lake, Lake City on up. If you take a ride in April, they're just gorgeous. This gorgeous carpets of yellow. And you can plant them um, in your yard as well. Many different ecotypes of black eye Susans and they do like full to partial sun or well-drained soil. That's a nice annual. And a word on annuals. Now these Black Eye Susans, depending on the type you get, are especially the roadside ones, they're perennials. They're gonna keep coming back. 
but an actual annual that lives up to its name of just you know being there for one season. They're fun, but I wouldn't go overboard with those. You know, if there's an area or you want to put them in pots and that's the area that you want to change with the seasons, then that's fine. That small area. But just remember annuals um, that aren't self-seeding, that don't become perennials, that's a big carbon footprint you're putting out there by changing that plant, by having trucks bring them from somewhere else and sell them to the nursery and then you driving the home and you know and the growing of them just for a short season. So that's why I say keep annuals like a small fun area in your yard. Here's some others, any kind of marigold really, but here we have the calendula. They're gonna last, you can put them in in March and they're gonna last three to four months. And you know, then you could put them in different ones in after that that are gonna last three to four months. Your impatience, great shade plant. Um, I've had them um, act as perennials. You know, they came back year after year after year from the ground. Just after about the third or fourth year, they do get really leggy, you know, looking. But they're a great shade ground cover. And they bring you color in your shade. And we know they come in all sorts of colors and varieties. Here's some other annuals just to think about. You know, this wishbone plant here, Terenia. That'll you know keep going from spring to fall. I don't have very many annuals. I'm trying to go, I'm only giving you samples. This is by no means an exhaustive list. You have in your own mind the kind of plants you want to grow. But if you have a question about it, email me, uh, contact a local master gardener. If you have like a small nursery that you know you really, really trust, talk to one of them because you're, a lot of your up north flowers either aren't gonna grow here at all or maybe at a different time of year. Zinnias, they're, they're great. They're gonna last March through September, but probably not the same <laughs> zinnias. So, you know, you have a March through June and then you can have a different group June through September or they last three to four months or so in there. Bees love these, those are perfect, those flat landing areas. Those are great. Okay, let's move on to perennials already. Just a few perennials and you can see I am pointing out in the pictures um, what's native and what's not. Um, so here's a few, any of the salvias. Now some, this scarlet salvia, this picture here is, is native, but there's lots of um, salvias, lots of sages out there. And, you know, the long-tongued bees love these type of flowers and they'll just keep self-seeding, keep coming back. Coreopsis or tick seed. The seeds are little and black and look like ticks. These things in no way <laughs> attract ticks. Um, so we'll just call it Coreopsis so you don't even get upset by that name. That's our state wildflower. And uh, there's various types, Leavenworthi, and there's other types too where these little fringy things look a little bit different from one to the other. They're all fantastic native perennials. And these transfer very well into your landscape and you can find them at, you know, um, one of the places you can find a lot of these seeds I'm gonna have at the end is uh, the Wildflower Foundation. And you can send away to them and they'll send you seeds for a lot of these. Or you can attend, you know, be on the lookout for these native plant spring sales that are gonna be going on. But one word of warning there, you can have fun and take some friends and maybe go all over Central Florida to various uh, native plant places. Um, you know, there's, there's several very nice ones in Groveland, all that. Do that, have fun, have lunch, have a good time. Don't <laughs> take a group here and go up near Buddy in Tallahassee, or don't take a group here and go down 
to Brevard County because you're going to be getting, they're not going to be native to your area. So stay within your planting zone when you're visiting these native plant centers so that you get something that's going to grow properly for your area. Because Florida's big. Florida is very, very big. If you picked up Florida and put it in Georgia, it'd probably measure up to at least Virginia or so. You know, it's, it's a big, long state. So we have different uh, topography, different weather, you know, so, and of course, different plants. Daylilies, they're another um, great perennial to have around. Um, and they come in so many different varieties and have a lot of fun with those. One of our few bulb plants that we can grow pretty, pretty well here in Florida. Here's some other uh, blanket flower is always a fabulous like meadow type flower to have. Um, why don't I have a native license plate on it? And I talk about this a lot. So for those of you who have already heard this, bear with me. Blanket flower has been kicked off the native plant team um, because it's been determined that it was not here prior to European um, settlement. It wasn't here in a 1500, at least not the ecotype with these big, lovely, beautiful orange faces. So it's okay. I love blanket flower anyway. And I've got a bunch of it for my yard. Uh, African iris, if you're like in like the mid rib of Florida, like Brooksville, Dade City, Inverness, where there's more in oak hammocks. Oh my gosh, you'll be trying to give these things to your neighbors. They grow like crazy there. Um, they don't grow quite as well in the sandy areas, you know, but, but you can try. They're just beautiful. This uh, beach sunflower, that is a native, grows all year long until it freezes. And you'll be like, oh, thank God, this finally froze. Now I can cut it back. And it'll come back and be beautiful, you know, for you again. And of course, pentas. Pentas, I think even the blanket flower, you can usually find in your big box stores. And those are all wonderful uh, butterfly plants as well. I have not been successful treating pentas as a perennial. So some of those annuals I would have up there, like the Black Eye Susan, should be moved over to the perennials and maybe put the pentas up in annuals. Other people do have success with more than one year with pentas. Here's some other perennials. Um, our friend, Euthanasia, purple cone flower. I'm always, um, haven't, haven't had success. I've only tried with seeds. I'm gonna try and get some and see if I can grow some in my yard. They're just gorgeous. Now this sunshine mimosa. This is a picture of, uh, native plant expert here in Hernando County. This is her lawn. And that's what she uses. It's the sunshine mimosa with the pink powder puffs. Now the plant itself will be there all year, but these pink powder puffs, they bloom like that all spring and summer. Um, it probably got, you know, bit by the cold, but it'll start growing back and do marvelous. Now there are people who get upset with this sunshine mimosa. So Word of warning, like Rita here uses it for a lawn, she lets it spread around. I have had other people get literally angry <laughs> because it's spread too much. So just keep an eye on it, put it where you're gonna let it uh, roam free. Here's some shrubs to think about. This oak leaf hydrangea is a native. Um, it is really cool because I think even when it's not blooming, it has really neat looking oak leaf type leaves. Great shade plant, great pop of color in the shade. Um, and it is native all up the coast. I saw it at uh, Monticello, uh, Thomas Jefferson's home. So, you know, it's, it's native pretty far up. Here's some of my favorites. <laughs> and this is um, by no means native. Now there are native azaleas. And you can certainly go out and maybe go to some of those native plant sales and look for the native azaleas. And they have really funky, cool kind of orangey, yellowy, 
you know, artistic <laughs> kind of flowers. You know, but the old southern look here with the old, these are called Karoom azaleas um, under the oak trees. To me, that just, because I've been here nearly 44 years, this is what says spring to me. Um, and there are many different types of azaleas you can get, some that even bloom, you know, in the fall and all year long. But they, here are the old fashioned uh, Karoom azaleas under the oak trees, looking beautiful. Here's another, here's a native, a Walters viburnum. Now the Walters is the one that, that's native and it can get pretty tall and spread pretty wide. So if you're looking for screening, you might wanna start looking for Walters viburnum. And I have this growing naturally around my neighborhood. Um, I try to get some neat pictures of it. If I knew of a way to rescue it from the lot that it's in <laughs> without getting in trouble, before the lot that it's in becomes someone's home and then this becomes destroyed, I would do so. But I definitely have my eye on purchasing some Walter's Viburnum if I can find some for this reason. Speaking of the growth around uh, my house, um, I did buy the lot next to me, but the lot behind that one has been cleared and it looks pretty certain that they're building a two-story house behind that. So I don't know what a you know good offense will really do, but I'm thinking, oh look, see these for viburnum, they even start spreading and they're going to attract wildlife. And if I can put them in an area where they'll just you know let them roam free, they'll at least get to be like 25 feet tall. So that's an idea I have in mind. Here's one I haven't really thrown in there before. So I wanted to give you something different. This tulip poplar, and you can see the reasons it really hasn't been thrown in there before. It's in the Florida Friendly Landscaping book, but the Florida Friendly Landscaping book doesn't have tremendously wonderful things to say about it. It's in the book, so it's a Florida friendly plant. And it has really cool yellow to orange, late spring, early summer flowers and these beautiful tulip shaped leaves. We here in Hernando County, we're at the end of its um, zone, as far as the southern end of its zone in 9A. And it does say it is susceptible to pests and diseases, and it has low wind resistance. <laughs> so keep those things in mind, keep it away from where it would fall from a building, and don't spend a lot of money on getting it, you know, because you might have some problems with it. But it's definitely a fun, a uh, fun spring blooming tree to think about. Here's our Chickasaw plum. A lot of people might mistake these for dogwoods. Dogwoods, um, dogwoods and red buds 20 years ago, and again in the oak hammock areas of Brooksville, Dade City, Inverness, you know, those type of Ocala, you know. Oh my gosh, they were so beautiful. But a couple of things have been happening. Um, dogwoods all over the country are struggling with an anthracnose disease. And we have always been at the southern end of their growing um, range for both red buds and dogwoods. And it's getting hotter. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not here to talk about the where's or the why's, and I'm not smart enough to know the where's or the why's or to separate all the data and everything. All I know is, is it's getting hot, <laughs> getting hotter. So that, I think just that little bit, you know, we may go up a degree or so every few many years, a couple of degrees hotter, longer than we were before is affecting our range of where these dogwoods can grow. But the Chickasaw plums are out there just doing their thing, just as happy as can be. Um, and you can purchase these at native plant nurseries. I believe the master gardeners might have access to some here in Hernando County. They were given away um, from forestry, I believe, as part of Florida's Arbor Day um, program. You're probably not going to get the plums. Don't count on having the plums. Those are going to the wildlife. But they're a great small tree, and they can be very well adapted to urban areas as well. Now let's talk about magnolias. 
another southern uh, thing. But you know, your southern magnolia, yeah, wow, those are gorgeous flowers, 100 feet up there. <laughs> so let's bring them down. <laughs> your saucer magnolia and your little gem um, are brought down to more, you know, human <laughs> levels where you can see and enjoy them in smaller yards. Your saucer magnolia is not a native. Your little gem is a native hybrid. So, you know, then people, native purists do not believe in those two terms. They think that's an oxymoron. <laughs> you can't have a native hybrid. Well, but this is a native hybrid. Um, anything with uh, quotations or has a name like that, they're gonna tell you has less wildlife value because the more you hybridize something, the less you know the wildlife out there recognizes it as a plant so that's you know that's their stance um doesn't mean they don't recognize it it just means native plants have always been around and that is what our wildlife is used to so we bring in um you know uh non-native plants or we hybridize them we change them up we are changing evolution <laughs> in these pollinators and birds and things don't move that quickly. That being said, yes, this is a nice, it is a nice little gem and you can bring those flowers, you know, for your enjoyment down to a level that can fit in your yard. Now we are running a little bit over time like uh, Dr. Lester probably thought we would. So I'm just gonna talk about some of the wildflowers out there. And some of these you can incorporate in your landscape. And some of them are just too free spirited <laughs> to want to do well in your landscape, but go out, see if you can find them and enjoy them. But this blue eyed grass is one of the blue flowers of spring. I bet you if you take a ride up the uh, Sun Coast Parkway north, heading towards 98, pretty soon, maybe in April ish or so, May you're gonna find fields and fields are on the roadside of this blue-eyed grass. You'll also find it in a lot of the wildlife management areas around here. Just gorgeous. And you can find it at native nurseries. Um, do not, do not, do not go anywhere and dig it up off the roadside or, or in um, the woods to plant in your yard. But just know that some of these you can find at native nurseries and establish them in your yard. Okay, the flocks are gonna be popping up any second now. If they haven't already, maybe I just haven't looked. So all along 1950, you're gonna see these wonderful purple, white flocks, P-H-L-O-X. The ones we see on the roadside are not native. There are native varieties of flocks in Florida, but they don't spread as well as these ones, the Phlox dramundi, and these are the Texas cousins of our native Phlox. Um, aren't they gorgeous? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Fill up our roadsides with those purple carpets or some fields, and you can get seeds for those from that wildflower foundation as well. Don't even try to pick up the seeds or try to transplant these from the roadside unless you want to be fined rather heavily. Blazing Star is another. You may have this already growing near you if you live in the Royal Highlands like I do, you probably will. But if you like uh, more of it, you can find seeds for it too or look in native um, plants, um, nurseries. Liatris is the other name, beautiful plant there. And here is some that um, you know you may already have growing <laughs> because nature put them there in your yard. And this one is Biden's alba, Spanish needle. Biden's means two teeth, referring to how the petal is shaped. Alba means white. You're saying, why are you showing me a weed? <laughs> because this weed, I have a love-hate relationship with it. Mostly love though, 
because if I want a picture of any kind of pollinator, all I have to do is walk outside where my Spanish needle is and I'll get some. So when it grows, it's not growing right now, it was all froze back, it'll be coming back shortly. When it grows, I try to keep, try to keep it under control, try to keep it where no one's gonna walk by and get all the stickers on it or the dogs or anything like that, but I can't get rid of it because, oh my gosh, every pollinator out there just loves it. This bee balm also grows naturally around me. Um, I'm trying to see if I can get it to grow actually in flower beds, but it's gorgeous too. I've not been lucky with passion vine out where I live now. When I used to live in an oak hammock, it grew wonderfully, but I keep trying. And uh, the Stokes Aster is another native wonderful uh, wildflower. All of these can grow fine in most yards. Now let's talk about the wild ones, the ones that are just too free spirited to be caged up in your yard. <laughs> They're gonna do what they wanna do. Maybe if it's their idea, maybe they're already in your yard, but you didn't put them there. Um, but a lot of these can be found in wildlife management areas, things like that in the wooded areas. This is one of the thistles, um, the bristle thistle. It's also called horrid thistle for a reason. So maybe, you know, it's not something you really want to have to deal with in your yard. But if you are a photographer and you want a picture of a butterfly, go into an area where you find this uh, growing and just sit and wait and the butterfly will pose on it <laughs> for you. Gorgeous kind of thistle. And then when this one is done, the big one, the horrid thistle, <laughs> the bristle thistle, then um, not all thistle comes out right after it. It's a little bit smaller in its head and the butterflies love it too. This one you probably do have in your yard and you thought it was a weed, but it is not a weed. <laughs> it's a beautiful Florida green eyes. Um, and they only grow in Florida. They are endemic to Florida. They attract butterflies and insect pollinators. You're probably not gonna have any luck transplanting them. They're kind of the dandelion of the South really, but um, let them grow where they wanna grow. This is one of my absolute favorites, marsh pink. It's in, you know, it's a pink, pink family. Look at, doesn't it look like somebody drew this around that yellow star there? Then the stamen just kind of pokes out. You, I'm not sure if anyone can really grow this in their landscape. If, if you can, let me know. It's gonna have to be a very wet area, you know, marsh, <laughs> marsh pink is what it's called. Um, it's almost endemic to Florida. It's been found in one other county um, in Alabama, but the pollinators love it. So if you, if you can get out and drive around in some of the wooded areas and you're near a marshy type area, look for this, this marsh, pink, marsh pink, it's just gorgeous. Here's another one that grows on its own. It grows a lot in the uh, Royal Highlands. So it likes the dry sandy areas. But I'm not sure how successful you would be getting it to grow where you told it to grow. But this sky blue lupine, just take a walk and look for bunches of it. It should be coming up in the next month or so. Absolutely gorgeous. It looks kind of like a northern kind of plant <laughs> that, you know, it likes to grow in the middle of, you know, sand hills. Fantastic sky blue lupine, beautiful name. So we are running a little bit over and you're gonna ask me about veggie gardens, which I certainly don't have time to talk about. And besides that's Dr. Lester's, uh, <laughs> that's his uh, baby there to talk about veggie gardens and he's going to do so. Um, at least a combination of people from the University of Florida. He's gonna talk about, they have a whole um, uh, you know, series going on, food systems in season, Spring vegetable gardening. Here's the YouTube link. Um, I don't have the date on here, so you'll have to go to that YouTube link and find out, you know, when they'll be presenting it live. And if you miss it, I know it hasn't happened yet, but it, if you miss it, you can always go back and listen to the recording later. 
Here are some of the resources. This is the um, Florida Association of Native Nurseries. So if you're looking for where can I find some native nurseries or who has this particular plant, that's the place to go. This FloridaWildflowers.org. That is your Florida Wildflower Foundation. Check out their website, it's beautiful. And that is where you can order different seeds, different seed packs of wildflower. Not all natives, but mostly so. <laughs> But that's where you can get those uh, Texas flocks as well. And also look up your local Florida Native Plant Society. Ours is the Hernando chapter. Find out what they've got going on and um, when they'll have nursery or uh, plant sales and things. And here's just for spring in general, some books you can find gardening or publications, sorry. Gardening with annuals in Florida, gardening with perennials in Florida. And this is a book, this book of lists, if you want to look it up. Um, it's neat because you can decide, I'm looking for purple flowers, <laughs> you know, and look up purple flower, or I'm looking for shrubs with yellow shower, flowers. It'll give you great ideas for that. And on Hernando County Government YouTube, a lot of the things I hit on today are discussed more in depth in these various um, videos, Pretty Plants That Beat the Heat, Reading Weeds, Pulling in the Pollinators, Spring Bloomers are gonna talk more about those wild ones that I just showed you, get to see more of those. So you're at the nursery, some tips what to do at the nursery, and also weeds or wildflowers, an introduction to overlooked pollinator plants. And here are, our upcoming Wednesday uh, Zoom classes. Next Wednesday, birdscaping. It'll be a lot of fun to talk about that one. And Dr. Lester and I have a two-part series on Florida gardening mythology. All the weird stuff we hear out there. I finally decided what I'm gonna do on March 30th. I just decided yesterday. We're going to, it's gonna be a class on be specific. Flowers and plants that attract native bees. And then on April 6th, um, Dr. Lester wants to talk about ways to identify and report possible invasive species. So we got a good lineup coming for you. Again, if you have any questions, like a PDF, here is my email, lilyb at hernandocounty.us. And um, go to Hernando County Government YouTube to find out those other classes. And we will see you, well, tomorrow, Dr. Lester and I have the virtual plant clinic. So look at my Facebook page or Hernando County Extensions for that link. And then next week, we will see you again for birdscaping. And thank you, everybody, and have a wonderful Florida-friendly day.